Well, hello there, my name is Polish Links, and welcome to the second episode of Cupid, in which we are in conscious of the girl you are looking for, and apparently we are her mother in that conscious, so, well, some card lady wants us to dance, how about no? Oh, make her do a handstand, I've seen one of those street people do that, quite marvelous. Now, oh, I'd like to see that. This part is getting quite boring. Well, come on, me bed, my bed, dance for your fruit. The girl looked at the beautiful, cruel faces of the woman. That look on them. It was a burning desire to hurt something, simply because they could. She knew that look. Before they touched her and hurt her, they had that look burning in their eyes. Ah, uh, look at what you did, Claudette. She's shivering like a leaf, poor thing. The lady was laughing as she said those words. I didn't do anything. She should be grateful we are even offering her this much. <sighs> Besides, these commoners are supposed to be jolly in their misery. <sighs> I'm really getting pissed off this. Of how I treat her. Come on, girl, show us your joy. The girl moved away as they laughed. Mother, please save me. Mother. Didn't I tell you to leave? Didn't I tell people? Uh, didn't I tell you people are cruel? Didn't I tell you to leave? Uh, cruel. Haven't I told you this time and time again? People are cruel. Now you see it firsthand. Hey there. A child's voice called out from behind her. It belonged to a girl around seven, with chubby cheeks and a look of curiosity in her eyes. She wore an old blue dress, somewhat patched at the corners, but kept clean and tidy. She was not rich, but she had an air as if she owned the ground she stood on. Uh, another commoner, this party is absolutely teeming with them. The Marquis loves these things. Heard he picks them randomly from the street. Maybe I should get me one, two? Oh my god, please stop. Do you think this, uh, it is fashionable abroad? In his birth country, I mean? Persia? No, no, I heard he was from India. I heard the rumor he's a bastard son of a Greek queen. God, this is so far fetched. I could barely pronounce his name, for so here he should change it to something more acceptable. Well, you should change your more attitudes to more acceptable. Who knows what kind of demons he might attract with uh, such a blasphemous name. Uh, it must be why there are all these nasty, horrid little creatures flock around him. Huh? Uh, devil or not, I will forgive him if he kisses my hand. What if he bites off your hand? Okay, that's some weird idea. The ladies laughed. So, aren't you shameless? Ok, and what kind of name you have, Salop? What the hell is, does it mean even? No one is named Salop! Don't lie, we all know why we're here. The ladies gossiped among themselves, openly ignoring the girl. The young girl took the slighting with a shrug. She approached the table and asserted her presence. What you doing? God, as they don't take a hint, do they? From something shiny, it might distract them. Hey, you've been holding that breath for a long time. Aren't you gonna give it to her? She pointed at the shabby rose vendor. Why do you care? Do you want the bread for yourself? I bet she's hungry too. I know, maybe you should toss the bread and see if they fight for it. The ladies laughed to themselves. The girls stared at them with confusion. Her brows furrowed in a childlike understanding. Next thing everyone knew, she had swept the bread from the woman's hand. Oh my! How rude! Horrible, filthy girl! Give it back! The girl sniffed a piece of bread and rebuilt at the surface. Oh, yummy, it's still warm. She shoved the bread in the urchin's face. The scrumptious scent of bread floated the rose girl's nose. Lick it, the sugar butter tastes good. No, you divvy child, give it back! The urchin licked it, her tongue was coated in sweetness. She stood there, squeezing the taste in her tongue. The girl grinned at her, 
and she couldn't help but grin back. Sorry, here you go, it's all yours. Ah, disgusting. Like we're going to eat anything. That's been in your filthy mouths. Whoa, so this is ours now. You ladies are so nice. She killed the brat, I'll have you thrown out of this party. I'll have you. A young man strode to the commotion, a sweet scent lingered as he passed. The rose girl felt her mouth well up. His presence filled her body, almost as if, if her hunger was abated. She blushed furiously. What a strange effect he had. Ladies? Ah, oh, Sir Gillian! Julem? Gillian? Uh, I don't know. Let's go with Julian. Julian? Does it make sense? I don't know. I just came to check in on my esteemed guests. Is everything right? Are you enjoying yourselves? One of the ladies started fanning herself with obvious annoyance. Ah, these little beasts have been harassing us. Yes, my lord. We were just minding our own business when this girl swept the food off our table. Horrible little nits. The girl stuck out her tongue at them. A lady whipped her eyes in mock tears. See, look at that. It's absolutely monstrous how these children act around adults now. There is no respect, bizarre. I worry for the next generation. Well, you actually don't res deserve any respect. But that's only my opinion. And you don't have any respect from me, card lady. One, two and three. Ah, Charlotte, don't cry. Well, my lords, we would all breathe as easier if those children were sent on their way. Yeah, who knows what kind of mischief they might be up to. In that situation, court ladies out. They might set fire to tables, you see. Oh. Or steal our jewelry. In fact, I think my pocket watch is missing. Yeah, because you don't have one. No, how unfortunate. One of the ladies continued her childish waiting. It is, Messiah. It's unfortunate how we allow your important guests to be treated this way. And who do you consider important? Please deal with these vermins. Throw them out now. Oh, my sweet ladies, I am stricken with grief at your misfortunes. Allow me to offer my heartfelt apologies. Unfortunately, this child is my important guest today, and you are, sad to say, paltry squatters. Excuse me? Madame Charlotte of Montpellier? I don't remember sending you an invite. Same for you, Lady Antoinette of Rennes and Lady Claudette of Lyon. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes! Oh yes! Yes! That's what I was waiting for. <sighs> Most people I've invited are huge patrons of music. That is why they are here today. They come to listen to Mademoiselle Catherine Louise Perret. She is the seven-year-old piano prodigy who played for the Queen last summer. The man pointed at the girl, boozy, chewing her half of the bread. The rose girl just stared at the unfolding situation. Well, that's... I'm sure you were aware of that, were you not? <laughs> no matter, I'm always happy to see you ladies. It is my pleasure to have you here. Oh, kick them out! But I hope you don't mind giving some of the food to away to my townspeople. That is why I keep my gates open. My servers are instructed to serve everyone who passes by, not just my guests. Don't you fret, my darlings, there's plenty more to be served. Oh my goodness, throw them away! What is wrong with you? The ladies blushed in embarrassment. One of them began to fan herself even faster. Yeah. Excuse me. The Marquis woke up to the two girls. The rose girl's heart beat so fast it made her f head feel light and dizzy. She had never been this close to him. It made her feel a mixture of fear and elation. Lady Catherine, your father has been looking for you. It is almost time for your performance. The girl looked up at the Marquis and did a little artsy. My apologies, sir. I didn't mean to cause a clutter. Guilherme chuckled. Guilherme. 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 <laughs> I saw the whole thing, ma chérie. You put those ladies in their place. 
They were being mean to her. Gillem narrowed his eyes at the quiet girl. She hid behind her basket of roses. She couldn't look at him directly. He was like the sun. It hurt just to be in his presence. Yet there was relief in her heart as she stepped closer. As, she, uh, as he stepped closer to her. I've seen you before, haven't I? The rose girl nodded and paid a curtsy. I deliver roses to your house sometimes, sir. Huh, yeah, the girl with the sweetest face. The rose girl blushed. I love your roses, by the way. They stay fresh longer than they should. You've tended to them with love. Thank you, sir. Do you have a name, young lady? I... Uh, what's the matter? Is it alright, young lady? If you would rather... Let's call her Rosa. Huh? Rosa, it fits her. I think she forgot her name, or she lost it. The Marquise nodded wisely. A valid point. Hmm, are you alright with that, Rosa? Yes? Come on, Rosa, you watch me play, right? I... Her eyes started from the girl to the Marquise. Uh, Sir Gilly doesn't mind. Gilly? He's really nice to me and my family. And he helps the people around town, too. He won't throw you out. The Marquise held his right hand in the air as if swearing on oath. I won't. See? Come on, you're invited now. You're my special guest. There's plenty of food inside too, Rosa. Please help yourself. Thank you, sir. Rosa's coming! Yay! Now, this is my first public performance, Rosa. I'm a bit nervous. Catherine scratched her head. What will I do if I make a mistake? Papa will be very upset. The Marquise knelt in front of Catherine and dropped her shoulders fondly. You won't make a mistake, ma chérie. As long as you put your heart into the keys. Play to touch your audience, and any mistake won't matter. Do you understand? Catherine stared at the Marquise. Not really. The man chuckled. <laughs> you will, someday. Just play your first song with me in your mind, will you? Something that you think will make me smile. Killing. Julem Gilim held Catherine's clear, young eyes in his gaze. He kissed her hand, it was covered with sticky sugar and bread crumbs. Catherine blushed, it was the first time she looked embarrassed by anything. It would be my pleasure, sure. Catherine trudged up the wooden podium and walked towards the middle of the stage. The crowd's chatter died down. She card sight in front of her audience, waved to her father and stole a glance at Gilem. The man gave her a tiny nod. She sat down in front of the piano, admiring the cream and ebony keys underneath her fingers. Her own piano was broken and beaten, father had sold his horse for it. The A3 key never played and the strings would creak when it was called. But it had never failed her. She knew the keys like they were her own fingers. She whispered to the new piano softly, as if coaxing a beautiful, untamed animal. Let's be friends, okay? She saw Rosa at the far end of the podium, watching her diligently. There was a renewed vigor in her blood. She could hear the keys calling out to her. A song that would make him smile. She placed her fingers on the keys. She began to play. At the ring of the first few notes, it became apparent to the audience that this girl was something special. Here was a little girl, barely tall enough to reach the pedals of the piano, playing as if she owned it. There were times she'd miss a note or two, but that didn't matter. She played a song to make someone smile, and it touched everyone present. Her musical, musical skill was far beyond her years. Her fingers cursed the keys as if she was making a flower crown, carefully weaving, weaving the petals. 
She knew the correct way to tie the leaves so they wouldn't tear, like all smart little girls did. As the piano sang under her hands, Catherine seemed to disappear right in front of the audience's eyes. She was just a vision after all, somebody leading them down a dream. A dream of a garden, the springtime, the shade of a tree on a windy day. The couples in the audience tightened their grip on the hands of their partners. Some closed their eyes and let the music saturate their soul. Sweet memories of youth. A first love. The young of a newborn. Rosa's eyes shone as she stared at Catherine. Her heart was captured by this image of her. A young girl swung her head to the music, smiling as the notes poured out of her. She couldn't take her eye away from Catherine's glowing face. Was this happiness? Was this love? She looked like she was in love. And she was, wasn't she? In her innocence, she was still in love with life. In love with her family, with her pets, in love with every new discovery. She was full of hope. It was a bittersweet feeling for Rosa. A happy third teardrop rolled down her cheek. She wanted to warm herself in that hope, if she could. In the audience, Jim and Catherine's father sat beside each other. Separate, your daughter is amazing. <laughs> she is, isn't she? I mean, pardon my arrogance, my liege. I am very proud father, you see. No pardon necessary, sir. Has she found a sponsor yet? The Duke of Versailles once spoke to me about it, but we have not made any arrangements. Then I must steal her away as soon as possible. Sir? I'd like to be Catherine's primary sponsor, if that is alright for you. Why, sir? And to further cement my status, that piano she's playing right now? It is hers. I've bought it for her. Francois's eyes widened in an astonishment. F that is... Francois gulped. That is beyond generous, sir. Garam smiled. Julien smiled. Well, I must make it hard for you to refuse me, you see. I took the opportunity of asking you outright. You see, the Duke might offer an extravagant piano plated in gold. In that case, I have no choice but to humbly concede. W what? I am kidding, the Duke of Versailles is the worst misser you e will ever meet. The man chuckled. Of course, I should be paying for her musical tutoring as required, along with an ample sti stipend to accommodate your family. Ah, uh, you don't have to look so surprised, Monsieur Perriot. Your daughter is a star. There is an effervescence about her that enraptures the soul. There is no doubt in my mind that she will succeed. Thank you deeply, my liege. Please call me my name, Messiah. Let me remind you that generosity isn't without charge. Her tutoring could be done at my house. I want to monitor her progress. Apart from that, I'd very much like Catherine to visit me and play from time to time. Music is one of my true passions. Huh. Her presence will benefit my mood tenfold. Of course, sir. That is a small price to pay for all your efforts. offers. On the contrary, Messiah. You don't have to decide now. Kindly think about it. Thank you, my lord, Sir Julem. And with that, let's end the episode, actually. <sighs> okay, the question is, is he really a good kind of person or just a lodicon? Well, I guess we'll find out with time. Hope you enjoyed that episode and see you in the next one. Bye.